Goblins are mythological creatures of unclear origin and contradicting descriptions. They are small humanoids of a mischievous nature, possibly belonging to the Fey family, along with creatures such as red caps, brownies, leprechauns, kobolds, etc. The origin of the word goblin can be traced back to the British Gobelinus which was the name of a demon that once caused trouble in Normandy. It has been theorized the term began with kobold which was a German face spirit whose origins can be traced to one of a variety of earlier myths based in paganism from various other culture. Kobolds also gave their name to Kobold, due to the fact that new advances in mining in Germany during the Middle Ages allowed access to large amounts of Kobold ore. Although the mining was very dangerous and they had no idea how to smelt the metal so as a result the numerous mine collapses as well as the theft of the ore with only poison and ash left behind were blamed on kobolds. Either way, goblin myths often involve mischief, mining, and chemistry. In modern fantasy, the term goblin has been very much determined by the Tolkienian use of the word, as in a species of humanoids in service to evil, with the orcs being another word for the same thing, with Tolkien claiming the etymology for that word being an old English term for demon. Goblin appearance has been further shaped by both video and board games, as well as various artists. They are universally smaller than humans, although the exact size varies, and often have large pointy ears, larger and more animalistic than elf ears, and either long, crooked and pointed noses or orc-esque noseless features. The typical goblin stereotype is that of a savage warrior and raider that attacks villages and ambushes and wary travelers. Being one dimensionally evil, they can be, and are, killed without remorse in large numbers, unless you read a Baron, G, Lutet, or Terry Pratchett snuff. Another goblin stereotype is that they are a race of unusually technologically advanced and ludicrously smart and cunning race on par if not better than dwarfs such as creating fantasy machine guns or an entire robot army such as those in Warcraft or Dungeon Siege. They act and move in smaller groups as they don't pose a large threat by themselves and are commonly the first combat encounter for a young adventurer. Goblins tend to live in caves and gang up with orcs and similar races, to whom they are sometimes described as belonging to the same family or species. Their intelligence is usually fairly low, although among dumber and larger brutes will be the clever ones doing the skilled work while the bigger ones shout orders. Because of the comedy potential, players have always liked being goblins, and they were one of the three most popular races requested for an add-on to 5e as of a, no longer, recent survey. Goblinoids include a vast array of species in D&D, ranging from obscurities like the stone-skinned norkers and that they heal when you hit them, die if you heal them nilbogs to mainstays like the more organized hobgoblins and the big, scary, pseudo-orcs called bugbears. In TG Media, in the Iron Kingdoms and Magic, The Gathering, sometimes, goblins have a penchant for technology and love to tinker with machinery, especially steampunk contraptions and the like, somewhat propagating the mad scientist archetype. In Kings of War goblins are still a source of evil comic relief. They are often suggested to have been created by the Celestian Gark and the Black after he finished creating the orcs with whatever was left, although where exactly they came from is a mystery. They're still engineers as in many settings but they tend to be very short-term thinking and don't like to test things before they use them. In a baron, goblins are quite a bit different than their usual portrayal. Described in the D&D section below in Pathfinder, they are stupid little freaks with all manner of strange quirks, good singing voices, fear horses and writing, like fire and pickles. Sort of a cross between gremlins and a baby eating stitch. They are also very funny and, somewhat, lovable, and even have their own comic series. Surprisingly, despite being described as naturally inclined towards a mixture of chaotic stupid, easily distractible to the point of stopping combat mid-swing to chase a frog or pick their nose, and stupid evil, love of torturing anything smaller than them, behaviors, they have no mental penalties. Pathfinder also has a goblin variant called the Monkey Goblin which is even stupider than regular goblins, but much stronger and more agile, using a rat-like prehensile tail to aid it in a life in the trees. In Malia Forks, 
They have noseless hillbillies with very few woman folk called gremlins complete with straw hats, jug bands, blunderbusses, and lots of pigs. Also come in an Asian variant. Tolkien goblins. Tolkien was not consistent on the relationship between goblins and orcs. Initially he said that goblin was merely the halfling word for orc. Later work said that goblins were a subtype of orc. Later still works treated goblins and orcs like completely separate creatures. So take your pick. Generally since the Hobbit is the central foundation to his stories and it makes a point of explaining that orcs are just larger types of goblins. Along with Lord of the Rings having most orcs as being not much bigger than hobbits. Goblins are seen as around hobbit sized. Goblins and orcs are given different backstories from Tolkien. Although the most prominent one is they are the twisted forms of elves tortured and beat into submission by Morgoth and Sauron. Other origins are being an Asian group of elves stolen from their people and bred as slaves by Morgoth and Sauron. Just being animals uplifted by M&S, fallen Malia, men who were corrupted rather than elves, or a mix of the two, with some interbreeding with humans as another possibility or slimy rocks transformed by Morgoth magic into living beings. Regardless, almost all were the backbone of Sauron's armies who have heavily industrialized and produce only ugly things that cause sickness. Perhaps as a metaphor for wartime industry. Canonically Christopher Tolkien decided on them being elves who were among the first group of elves but believed Morgoth's whispers that the Valor were beings of evil and fled from them into the woods when the Valor first met the elves later captured by all lured into Morgoth's power. The notion of an entirely evil race conflicted big time with Tolkien's Catholic beliefs, so there are hints that not all goblins and orcs were evil, as a few passages indicate no race was wholly united for or against Morgoth. There are independent groups of goblins in The Hobbit, and a few lines given indicate that orcs will go to great lengths to avenge their fallen leaders. While in his notes he considered them a race capable of free choice and thus not the always chaotic evil that many later works paint them to be. Although Tolkien did try to avoid overtly assigning any real life peoples to his fantasy races the goblins are very blatantly Asians with fangs and Tolkien once described them as Mongol types. Warhammer edit an early Warhammer fantasy battle. Goblins were merely a shorter variety of orcs which were green-skinned evil humanoids who sometimes bred with humans. In fact, Warhammer Fantasy was the very first depiction of goblins and orcs as green-skinned, something that has since become a staple of the races in pop culture. This is mostly because they came from model ranges that GW had lost the right to sell like Tolkien D&D and needed to quickly rebrand them as something more generic to finish selling their existing inventory. With the creation of Warhammer 40,000, the goblins became Grots, also called Gretchen, who like the orcs were actually a type of fungus ape. Between their legs is only two bulging spore sacs which burst upon death and grow into new Grots orcs in the ground. After 40k had massive success. This was ported back into Warhammer Fantasy and goblins along with the orcs became fungus men. Some old chill Warhammer fans have rejected this, and the term orc jenna can make many on TG go into flashbacks about the arguments inspired between the old fags and new fags on the subject. In both settings, goblins grots are smaller green skins who are extremely vicious but extremely cowardly and refuse to attack something unless they outnumber it 10 to 1 preferably more against non-threatening foes however they enjoy torturing them and pals are subjected to horribly slow deaths to the chittering amusement of the tiny green skins in warhammer fantasy goblins are independent of orcs many living in their own tribes a few even have their own gods like the forest goblins who worship the spider god despite this many goblins also join groups with orcs either to bully the orcs into doing the manual labor or where they are bullied into doing the manual labor. While only the black orcs are capable of actually producing new goods or learning technical knowledge among the larger green skins, goblins produce many things from giant flying ships to chariots. Of particular note is the night goblins. Master chemists whose biology is bizarre and alien in its fungus nature even to other green skins. Red goblins existed in the early model ranges as well as bugbears and kobolds but they vanished as the old model ranges were replaced. Apart from all this, the main distinction between goblins and 40k grots is that goblins aren't all weak, subservient slaves. 
Goblins individually are pretty weedy, but they do try and deck themselves out in armor and whatnot and can even take over orc tribes if a cunning or vicious enough boss arrives. Most often this will be a shaman for his tricks and ability to scheme or a night goblin warboss for being fucking insane. But even a normal, Acaplanes goblin warboss can be a significant threat in 40k. Grots have almost no freedom and are only found alongside their bigger kin. They're not the strongest, quickest, meanest, or anythingest compared to the orcs, except for being better shots and more cunning to the point of generally being brighter, though that's not saying much. In most cases they are at best assistants, at worst slaves and moving targets. The only exception is the Gretchen Revolutionary Committee, although that ended badly. They fare a little bitter in mech controlled settlements where their technological know-how and small size are in more demand. They may even be allowed to make their own tanks. Small and scrappy, but dangerous at least in both Warhammer's all green skinned speak in a British cockney accent, with heavy chav mixed in for variation. Goblins were renamed to Grotz in Age of Sigma. D&D Goblins. Dungeons and Dragons did not do anything particularly innovative with goblins. Instead, they are fairly close, ish, to their Tolkien roots, or, rather, to the simplified version of Tolkien's goblins. Small, hateful, Savage creatures that infest the unwanted corners of the world, constantly squabbling amongst themselves for power and occasionally spilling out to raid and terrorize the neighboring civilized lands when their numbers build up enough. Whilst Tolkien's goblins were actually quite inventive and adept at building things, since they were a combination of the two peoples that Tolkien most disliked, the central soldiers he fought in World War I, and the industrialists he believed were destroying the countryside. D&D's goblins lack that trait due to medieval stasis. They're not as primitive as lizard folk, but are basically just tribal scavengers, in a stark contrast to goblins in other settings being the chaotic and or evil tinker race. In fact, when you scratch the surface, D&D goblins may tap into the same evil mook bases as Tolkien's goblins, but actually are deliberately taken in different ways. Whilst originally D&D orcs and goblins are implied to have often worked together and even interbreed, by the time of Plan Escape the two were actually bitter enemies. The two races share the same heaven of Acheron, where they constantly war in an attempt to drive the other race to extinction. This even persisted into 3rd edition. When the orcs changed racial alignment of chaotic evil meant they shouldn't have been going to Acheron in the first place. This stands in stark contrast both to Tolkien, who initially said that orc and goblin were words in two different languages for the same race, and to other popular settings, such as Warhammer Fantasy and Warcraft, where goblins tend to be a strong racial allied orcs. Some saucer books usually setting dependent, present a more nuanced portrayal of them and give them a deeper culture than that, but for the most part, D&D goblins are your standard generic cannon fodder evil mook race. However, just like the orcs, goblins have a long history of being a potential PC race in Dungeons and Dragons. They've been playable in literally every single edition, with multiple incarnations in 3rd edition. The usual idea is to play them up as spunky little troublemakers either a braver analogue to the halfling or a less annoying version of the gnome. And, for what it's worth, goblin PCS are actually generally quite liked. In fact, goblins were one of the player races most requested for a formal update into 5th edition PC races. Given the second season of Critical Role features a goblin PC as a main character, in the form of not a self-loathing female who wants to become a halfling, and the fact that Pathfinder goblins have such an fandom that Pathfinder 2e promotes them to a core or book race, many are expecting 6e to feature playable goblins in the PHB, just like how 4e added the tiefling and the dragonborn. The biggest exception to goblins being generic evil baddies in D&D is the Baron setting, where they are given a nuanced portrayal with a deep and sophisticated culture. In a Baron, goblin is used to refer to bugbears, hobgoblins, and goblins. They are the descendants of the once mighty continent-spanning empire of Dakon that collapsed because of an invasion by the Dealkit, masters of the Plane of Madness. The invasion was eventually beaten back by an alliance between the Empire and the Orc tribes called the Gatekeepers. 
Badass men in black style druids who protect the world from Lovecraftian horrors. But the empire fell afterwards. They're not the savages that you can kill guilt free in every other setting. In the current day they are split up into three broad cultural groups. And a few splinter groups. The smallest of the big three are the heirs of Dakin or Dakini, which are the baddest super disciplined remnants of the empire who preserved their way of life after the empire collapsed by hiding underground or in secluded mountains and would like to bring goblins back to their previous heights. The various goblin races are all equal under the Dakini and share a eusocial bond like ants. They specialize in different tasks. The hobgoblins are administrators and soldiers. Females are usually bards. Goblins are workers, scouts and spies, and the bugbears are shock troopers and heavy laborers. But if you're better at a job outside your cultural role, the empire doesn't waste talent and puts you in that job. Then you have the Gulder, who made up the bulk of the descendants of the collapsed empire and had to deal with the fallout. Their culture degenerated into petty barbarian tribes with a might makes right mentality. Their eusocial bond destroyed by the deal kick. They are usually ruled by hobgoblins due to their superior ability to organize versus the other two subspecies. However, during the conflict known as the Last War they united and stole a chunk of land from the human kingdoms that they named Dargon. It's their new goblin homeland and they're starting to rebuild their culture from there. But nobody thinks it will last. It's ruled by an alliance of clans with the leader. Lahesh Heruak maintaining a delicate balance of power between them to maintain stability. He's tried to institute the rule of law and has been mostly successful, but a few clans, mostly in desolate areas where they can get away with it, only pay lip service. The country has been a success so far and their culture is slowly clawing its way out of the dumps. But many are worried that when Haruak dies it will all fall apart. So he is desperately looking for a competent successor. The last major cultural group are the city goblins. They're the descendants of Galder goblinoids who weren't killed or fled when the humans conquered the continent. And were enslaved for a few thousand years. They are mostly largey goblins. And were released from slavery about a thousand years before the current time. They're considered tax paying citizens and have all the rights, on paper, of human or demi human citizens of the countries they live in. However, they tend to be poor and live as second class citizens in many places due to racism and lack of opportunities. The majority of them are loyal to their country of birth and consider themselves regular citizens. And they often dislike the Golda for committing war crimes during the last war and giving goblins a bad name. Most of the ones who were sympathetic to Golda moved to Dargon. Goblins, like 99% of races in this setting, are not naturally evil in a barren. They have the same range of alignments as every other sentient race. For cultural reasons they do tend towards being lawful neutral, but only slightly. As a somewhat curious aside, D&D goblins are yellow. Mostly compared to the more usual goblin color of green. These even survived after the popularization of green goblins in many other fantasy settings. Most prominently the aforementioned Warhammer Fantasy and Warcraft. A few settings sometimes portray them as shades of grey. All the previously mentioned colors with a grey tint. They're even portrayed as red in some artwork. The D&D Goblin has a huge family tree. To the point they even coined their own racial name. Goblinoid. The two most prominent goblin kin are the bugbears. Large, hairy, brutish goblins that, arguably, are D&D's attempt to maintain the Aussie archetype without making orcs and goblins officially related, and the hobgoblins, who are literally Tolkien's Urukai. So I hear you guys are into thick big titty wafers. Well we got you covered at nickbedlier.co.uk. One stop shop for Kumja models. However we do sell a lot more than just smart models we got everything for running any fantasy settings and even some not grim dark science fiction models. In fact we even have some anime inspired models and video game. But if models is not your thing we also have some role playing adventures and D&D 5e meme subclasses. Also every video we will be giving away all our homebrew content to a subscriber of the channel. All you got to do to be in with a chance is subscribe. Today's winner is this guy. Well done. Claim your prize by contacting us via email at nickbedeercontact at gmail.com. Now let's get back to the video.
Half goblins. Given the strong connections between goblins and orcs in some settings, particularly in Dungeons and Dragons older editions, and the existence of half orcs, one may ask if there's ever been any love gift to half goblins well. Ironically, not really, though advanced Dungeons and Dragons claimed that goblinoids interbred with each other and with orcs all the time. That fluff was lost after the change to 3rd edition, which wanted to try and make the two races distinct. As for goblin-human crossbreeding forget about it, they barely gave half-orcs any love, so you can imagine they'd be less than interested in half-goblins. Except, there was one setting where goblinoids took the place of orcs. In the Dragonlance setting, orcs don't exist, being replaced by goblins and draconians. And so the half goblin appeared there in 3.5's races of Ansel and Source book. Surprisingly, they're known for both being very self-confident and assured. In fact, their charisma penalty is described as stemming from coming across as too confident, making them seem overbearing or aggressive. In contrast to the propensity for Wongsting endemic to half orcs and half elves in other settings, very brave. In contrast to the traditional goblin cowardice, and with a drive to be peacemakers and diplomats, rather like half-elves. Essentially, rather than bitching about being rejected by both worlds, human and goblin, or about the lack of a true half-goblin culture, half-goblins are near universally driven to try and force the world to shape up and make a culture for them by bringing goblins and humans to work together in peace, which is actually kind of badass and certainly a change from the norms for half-breeds. In essence, they are said to combine human ambition and drive with goblin ferocity and mob mentality. Half-goblins are described as looking more or less like human-sized goblins. Half-bugbears might be particularly hairy, and half-common goblins shorter than average, but still within the human stature. Although this stature can lead to them being mistaken for hobgoblins, they apparently lack quite as many fangs and have more human-like eyes, which makes the difference obvious enough at a closer look. Magic. The Gathering. It should be no surprise that goblins appear in magic. Showing up in the very first set, goblins have risen to be one of the most popular tribes in the game and boy do they get a ton of support they are known as the characteristic species of red which means that they show up in pretty much every plane as the default red aligned race in fact the number of planes in which goblins do not appear on can be counted on one hand in general when goblins show up they are shown to be chaotic and unruly they almost always have green or red skin and travel in large groups Though this isn't always the case. On Ixalan, they look more like monkeys with white fur and black skin and tend to be individualistic. They love fire and scrapping together machines and weapons that should by no stretch of the means work, but they do. More often than not, these inventions require the sacrifice of another goblin to get it working properly. As a tribe, goblins often have small bodies and weak frames. When they show up with high power, it's usually at the cost of toughness. They are cheap to get out onto the battlefield, cheap to search up, and attack fast. They are perfect for aggressive red strategies, and they often come with ways to dump out even more goblins out onto the field. This usually comes in the form of goblin creature tokens, but some of the most powerful goblins let you dump them straight from your hand if you don't wipe the board, or take out the few key goblins holding the deck together. You can expect the battlefield to be swarming with the little guys, and you'll be losing fast. Goblins aren't always evil in MTG settings. Usually they're more of a footnote that don't even appear in any actual stories, and on cards they're portrayed often more destructive than outright evil. There are occasional appearances of goblins on less chaotic contexts such as Burroughs Recruit which depicts a goblin footman. Mirrodin offers the biggest example of a heroic goblin. With the forest elf main character of the first block having a companion named Slobber that was an elderly goblin machinist. Warcraft. Goblins are a staple race in the Warcraft franchise. They have green skin, are very short, have long and strong fingers, long noses, large pointy ears, and sharp teeth. In Warcraft 2, when the game expanded to more than just humans, orcs, ogres, and demons. 
Goblins were first mentioned. They were small mechanically inclined lunatics who invented great devices and were gotier chemists. They offered their services to the horde since it gave them more opportunities to wreak havoc and the races that would come to be those of the alliance had ignored them for their entire history. The goblins mainly performed reckon and vip transport for the horde via their zeppelins. Demolitions in the form of suicide sapper squads. The invention of airtight missile launching capsules that were tied to the backs of giant turtles to use as submarines, and finally experimenting on their forest troll allies to transform them into giant berserkers. In secret they also helped the resident Sauron, an insane evil dragon named Deathwing, in his various endeavors. Goblins were described as insane, sadistic, and greedy for gold. In Warcraft 3. Goblins became a neutral group. It was revealed only a small portion of the goblin race actually worked with the horde, while the others have always provided their services to anyone with gold to spend and after the fall of the first horde they have enforced that their own race remain entirely neutral to all factions. They did little of importance other than provide transportation for the various power players in this time. When the second horde was building their capital of Durita. A small number of goblins led by world famous Gazlo provided them with fair deals, which is itself a big deal for their race, for goblin services including demolition. In vanilla world of Warcraft, goblin lore expanded even further, a small number of goblins were seen in the alliance, some among the horde, while it was revealed almost the entirety of their race dwell on an island called Kazan which is a massive underground city called the Undermine. The cartels run Kazan. The most powerful of which is the Steam Weedle Cartel which performs the basic services offered in Warcraft 3. They maintain a few cities around the world including Ratchet, Gazlo's city nearby Durita, Booty Bay, a port which services anyone who reaches it, mainly pirates although they are just as much a threat from pirate attack, Gajetson, a desert city of scum and villainy, plus a small gladiatorial arena, and Everlook. A town high in the mountains of Kalimda nearby ancient magical elf ruins. Goblins have a racial rivalry with the other mechanically minded race, gnomes, although hostility varies from giant robot wars to having a giant racetrack where they see which race can build the best vehicles to next door neighbors who collaborate with each other on inventions and take any opportunity to try and make the other admit their philosophy is better. In general. The goblin philosophy is chemicals. 50% chance of explosion is acceptable. Make it fast so it makes money while the gnomish philosophy is magic and radiation. Take your time and spend decades if need be. 10% chance of turning yourself into a chicken or a different color is acceptable. Make it for the love of knowledge and invention. In Cataclysm, goblins received a major update as they became a player race. One of the cartels which was one of the weaker ones, having their section of Kazan entirely on the surface, mainly producing pop culture, cars, sports, and edibles, joined the horde after Deathwing set their portion of Kazan on fire. Since in the middle of a not football game a ball was kicked and hit him. Their trade prince sold the entire cartel into slavery after charging them all their possessions for supposedly safe passage off the island. And the ships were caught in a naval battle between the Horde and Alliance. After conquering the island, they then joined the Horde which was in the middle of becoming a fascist genocidal dictatorship again thanks to shit leaders. Also. Their trade prince got to keep his job despite the mess he caused. They quickly upgraded the horde from catapults to giant robots and from bow and arrow to machine guns. Then created their own new capital by completely renovating a huge chunk of the continent into the symbol of the horde complete with a Mount Rushmore of their racial leader. During the Kazan levels it was also revealed that goblins have become multicultural, taking on things previously alien to them like worship of the light and shamanism. Although the former is seen as a combination of medic and television evangelism, while the latter is perceived as cutting deals with nature. Kazan is very modern and has television, pop stars, sunglasses, champagne, fancy cars, neon lights, not Chinese food, electricity and light bulbs, and many other conveniences not seen elsewhere in the rest of the renaissance setting outside the homeland of the gnomes. Goblin origins were also explained. In ancient times, 
Goblins were a semi-intelligent race of monkeys which were enslaved by island trolls and forced to mine a substance called Kajamite. Kajamite has a side effect of causing a huge boost to intelligence, although not coherent thought, in anyone who imbibes it, and one day the trolls lava masters entered the mines to whip their tiny labras and were disintegrated with laser beams. Since then, the goblins have mined Kajamite and used it as an ingredient in ingestibles of all kinds including Kaja Cola, although their supply was beginning to run out, and there was fear they may regress back to being mere monkeys without it. Like most cataclysm plots, this was never brought up again, although there were hints that with the Kaja Cola that was left everywhere they go, that monkeys drinking it have started becoming intelligent as well. Goblins in Warcraft 2 had extremely squeaky. High-pitched voices intended to babble or shriek. In Warcraft 3 the shrillness of the voice was lessened, and they became more calm and coherent. The goblins in World of Warcraft still have a voice that is higher pitched than a human, although only slightly more for males while gaining something of an American Brooklyn accent. The non-Bilgewater goblins still speak in their Brooklyn accent or a general American accent. Whereas the Bilgewater goblins speak like they're from New Jersey both in accent and expression. Goblin Slayer. The said goblin in this manga while being a weak, tiny and barbaric humanoid is capable of many unorthodox tactics and teamwork that they could outplay and mud a low level adventurers numerous times. Whom the said adventurers underestimate the cunning goblins. They are barbaric primitives so they have to loot tools. However, they are capable of some degree of intelligence. Like using signs like totems to create distractions as well as cover their weapons with urine and poisonous herbs to not only prevent adventurers from healing themselves, but also mark them with scents for goblins have an acute sense of smell. While they use mercenaries and pets such as wolves and orcs to further boost their effectiveness, the biggest contributors of their horde are their red shirt goblin goons, who are weak, small but expendable and effective while attacking in groups. The horde is often led by a goblin mage that is capable of casting spells like fireball. Oh, and this being Japan, they are sadists native to the moon who have only one gender and use females of other races to reproduce. Given their brutal nature, it's done via rape. What the hell else would you read this shit for Troll 2 Goblins? The notorious movie Troll 2 infamously features no actual trolls. 1. It instead features goblins. Thus, its presence in this article. Who live in the town of Nilbog, its goblin backwards, and who, for the purposes of this movie, are vegetarian monsters who turn their human victims into plants via various potions and other concoctions. The writer-director was an Italian with issues. Okay, that being said. The Troll 2 goblins are worth mentioning just because vegetarian monsters who convert their prey into plants is a fairly good line for just how weird you can go with goblins, and also a good adventure seed that could be used for a minor world of darkness mystery baddie. Monster girl depictions. Traditionally, the idea of goblins being monster generals was something of a niche. At best, most thought of them as just hideous. Stupid, filthy little monsters who would want to put their dicks in that ironically, it was Warcraft that probably first sowed the seeds of female goblins being fuggable. Whilst the attractiveness of female goblins in that game is contentious, people must admit that they were better looking than the tumor riddled, snaggle toothed, scarred abominations that make up the canon depictions of most goblins prior to that. They were certainly attractive enough to start scoring Rule 34 artwork. And this became a revelation to far TGUYS that goblin girls did not have to be fugly from there. Goblin girls became an underground sensation, slowly developing and evolving in the steamier underbelly of TG and on D, or at least its western counterpart Akko, until they have become as mainstream in the TG fandom as any monster general has a chance of being. Because goblins vary so widely in their depictions, it shouldn't be surprising that goblin girls likewise have been a particularly fertile ground for interpretations. There are five mainstream depictions of the goblin as monster general you will probably encounter on TG, and many different subforms and cross-pollinations. All depend on which of various goblin aspects that a creator deigns to focus on. Tinker skills, short-sighted hedonism, mischievousness, raw sexual appetites, and fertility. 
the pervy tinker archetype directly traces its roots back to Warcraft's Rule 34 goblins. This envisions goblins as a tetchy race with a strong loot streak, leading to them focusing their mad science skills on coming up with newer and more deviant ways of getting off, depending on the fundamental tech level of the setting and the creator's own tastes. This can range from aphrodisiac gas grenades and automated dildos to golems built as living sex engines and bimbafying transforming magitech ragans. Rule 34 interpretations of World of Warcraft lore can be counted as this, as well as rare goblins and corruption of champions that are mentally stable enough to keep their panties on. The shameless slut archetype likewise has its roots in Warcraft goblins. This of this their canonical obsession with money but is perhaps one of the more widely known generic archetypes as well. These goblins are hedonists who take a great deal of pride in their libido and their love of pleasure, integrating with the other races and usually gravitating towards roles based on entertaining. From barmaids to outright prostitutes. In fact, they are often depicted as actively enjoying whoring themselves out, as it ensures a steady stream of partners and profit whilst sating their perverse and degrading sexual desires. These goblin girls are often size queens, specifically choosing partners based on the stature of their masculine organs. The adult comic artist in cases focused on this one, and might as well started it with his drawings. The mischief maker archetype is the most innocent of the archetypes, portraying goblins as just playful, fun-loving hedonists whose greatest aims in life are pranking, partying and making love. Not necessarily in that order. The savage slut archetype is perhaps the oldest of the archetypes, for it owes its origins to the original interchangeability of goblin and orc. These goblins are basically sexy savages. Wild and primal little monster generals who live a primitive lifestyle centered on hunting, playing, and of course capturing and having sex with men. Essentially, this depicts goblins as short stack or a loophole for masturbating to underage children orcs. Kenkow Cross Monster Girl Encyclopedia is focused on that. The breeder file archetype is, in comparison, probably the youngest of these archetypes. These goblins are defined by their racial pregnancy fetishism and by having bodies almost literally built to breed. Being impregnated is intensely orgasmic. Pregnancy either fills them with ecstasy, makes them incredibly horny, or both. Birth is a series of some of the most intense orgasms in their lives and social standing often revolves around how many daughters they have to boss around. Plus plus plus. Scanning. Plus 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 congratulations Neophyte. You have just weathered the single worst cyclic assault a slana she demon is capable of unleashing. You may now be promoted into the ranks of the Grey Knights plus 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 this archetype does make some sense if you think about it. After all there's a cannon for the species for PC. Where do all the goblins come from corruption of champions might as well have started this archetype. The ghetto goblin s a variant of goblin girl portrayal native to urban fantasy settings. Combining parts of the shameless slut and breederphile stereotypes paired with some occasionally awkward racial coding. Ghetto Goblin tends to be used as a less racially offensive imitation of the hot-blooded Latina or Ghetto Black Girl racial stereotype, in that they are sexually open, tend toward foul language and fiery tempers when angry and lewd vocalizing or body language when aroused or teasing others, and frequently dress provocatively. While breeding for the Ghetto Goblin isn't usually as erotic as with the breederphile, the social status of the Ghetto Goblin is often measured by how many offspring they have, how often they have sex, and how early they first had sex. They arouse easily, to the point that human men in their stories often need to talk ghetto goblins out of outright molesting them openly in public. Whilst these archetypes are certainly well known, there are also two specific depictions of goblin monster generals that have achieved enough recognition to be recognizable by name. The MG Goblin and the Cock Goblin. The Monster Girl Encyclopedia depiction of the Goblin is essentially a mashup of the Mischief Maker and the Savage Slut archetypes. These primitive Mamono live in tribal clusters, entertaining themselves by playing pranks on each other or the races around them, hunting game, and conducting banditry for fun, profit and boyfriends. In appearance, they resemble pointy-eared human lollies with horns and superhuman strength. 
allowing them to fight with weapons that only a strong human man would normally have a chance of lifting. Simple-minded and carefree, they have no intention of giving up the lifestyle they so enjoy. The Cock Goblin takes its name from Corruption of Champions, a hentai fantasy text adventure game that was popular on TG for a while before the fact that furries are much more willing to put money where mouth is when it comes to getting fetishistic shit done led to the inevitable flooding of the game with beast folk waifless and encounters and TG promptly banished it. Still, before it went under, it had a significant impact on the goblin girl arena. Cock may not have created the idea of the breeder file archetype, but it certainly brought it to the attention of what passes for TG mainstream. Cox goblins are breedophiles who became a pregnancy obsessed all female race due to corruption of their water supply. Once a brilliant race of alchemists and inventors, they have since devolved into a savage slut culture, living in crude tribes based on a massively curvy matriarch. Her husband, S, and as many daughters as she can make who are willing to stick around. Whilst goblins are fiercely competitive with each other, there is also safety in numbers, keeping them from being eaten by hellhounds or raped beating to death by minotaurs. Such clans are often notably inbred, for their corruption means they have little sense of objection to incest, with only the matriarch's jealous possessiveness in regards her husband keeping her daughters at bay. They are also examples of the pervy tinker archetype, using what remains of their former knack for invention to create sex toys and perverse alchemical concoctions for use in subduing husbands and molding them to their liking. One memorable goblin monster general is Zanuck from RuneScape. Zanuck is a badass female goblin adventurer who is the star of one of the game's major story arc where she helps the player save her tribe of technologically advanced goblins from a KKK-like cult of racist humans and then from an evil god of war who wants to take back control of her tribe. Fans of the game were so mad when the developers killed her off unfairly, and also gave her a graphical update that made her too ugly, that they later brought her back with a cuter redesign, though now fans complain that her new look is too cute.